I'd like to thank the organizers very much for the opportunity to, uh, to uh, present here at this forum and also because I don't think I've ever had the opportunity to do this before, I guess I'd also like to thank um, Dr. Shabner publicly for his, you know, um, you know, teaching and mentorship, not only when I was a fellow, but, you know, sort of, you know, for the ongoing aspects of, of my career, and I really appreciate it. So uh, um, what I'd like to talk to you about today is um, sort of building on the theme that was raised by the last two speakers and sort of describe a bit of our approach and a few examples from two projects in my, in, you know, that, that have, that, that have uh, sort of my lab has been involved with to really, you know, that I think illustrates something about at least how you could think about how to target various aspects of, of cell metabolism. And so our approach really to tackle this issue of what altered metabolism might be doing to support cell growth has really been to take a step back and really ask, well, what is it that metabolism does for cells? And what might that tell us about how that altered metabolism that is observed in cancer cells might then be advantageous, um, which I would argue is the key to, to uh, targeting them. Now, if you take a step back, all cells have to take up nutrients from their environment. They have to take those nutrients in and break them down and generate energy, mostly in the form of ATP. And this is done primarily to maintain homeostasis. So that is move, maintain ion gradients across the cell, move cargo around the inside of the cell, do whatever it is that that cell specific function happens to be. Now, not surprisingly, most of these are thermodynamically unfavorable. What does ATP do for you? Well, ATP allows you to couple ATP hydrolysis as a way to make unfavorable reactions now favorable. And so perhaps it's not surprising from that perspective that many cells in our body really rely on metabolism that is really suited towards making a lot of ATP. If you're a heart cell, you need to beat every, you know, um, you know a second or so you really need a lot of ATP generated to do that. So you gear your metabolism for that, for, for, for those purposes. Now, cancer cells, or really any proliferating cell, has to do all the same thing. They have to exist as a cell. They have to do all the things that are necessary to maintain homeostasis. Except in addition to that, they have to take up additional nutrients, feed those nutrients into the exact same metabolic pathways that are there to generate ATP, and still generate the ATP they need, but at the same time generate all the components that are necessary to go from one cell to two cells. So, so that's all the DNA, all the RNA, all the protein, all the lipid, all the stuff that's required to get what we would call biomass in order to, to undergo the cell proliferation. And our work has largely focused on the hypothesis that what's going on with this altered metabolism in cancer cells, which is really seen in many proliferating cells, has more to do with how cells solve this problem, that is, not how do they make ATP, but rather how do they make biomass while at the same time generating enough ATP to survive as, as, as cells. Now, you might say, well, I took a biochemistry class. Don't we understand how all these pathways work? Well, indeed we do. And in fact, it's been quite carefully calculated how much ATP is required to exist as just a cell and how much ATP that you need to proliferate. And not surprisingly, you need ATP to do cell proliferation. But you, what you may be surprised to learn is that these two circles of ATP are actually drawn to scale. That is, the amount of ATP that's required to do cell proliferation fractionally is actually quite small relative to the amount of ATP that's required just to exist as a cell. And that's because most of the ATP that cells need really go into things, say, like maintaining the ion gradients across their membranes. And so we would argue then that this increase, this Warburg effect that you heard about from the previous two speakers, really has to do this increased, nutri this increased nutrient uptake isn't there to make ATP, but rather to make all of these other components necessary to, to uh, do, do cell proliferation. And maybe this underlies part of that paradox for why cancer cells may choose this less efficient, at least in terms of ATP production metabolism, because the metabolism isn't really there necessarily to make ATP. Now again, you might say, well, I took a biochemistry class. I understand how these pathways work, or actually you forgot how they worked, but once upon a time you understood how they worked. Except I can tell you now, because I have the pleasure of teaching pathway biochemistry to uh, 300 MIT undergraduates every spring, and I can tell you that what we teach in these biochemistry classes 
is only partially true. It's actually the class is mostly geared towards understanding how is it that we make ATP, that is how does glycolysis work, how does oxidative phosphorylation work. And when we really talk about regulation, we talk about all the beautiful ways that these pathways are interconnected such that if the cell is running out of ATP, it can self-correct to make more ATP. We also talk a lot about how glucose can get into any particular favorite biomass component, your favorite nucleotide or lipid. However, what's missing from that class, and I would argue it's missing because we really don't understand it, is how do you actually regulate this network to do all these things together to, to, uh, to uh, proliferate? That is what happens when you have plenty of ATP, because I think the evidence is actually overwhelming that most cancer cells or most proliferating cells, when they're proliferating, are not at all limited for ATP. How do you then continue to maybe do the opposite, that is not make ATP, and instead generate all the nucleotides and all the lipids and all the sugars that are structurally needed to build a new cell? Now, we would say that cancer cells certainly have figured out how to do this. We can all say cancer is a disease of uncontrolled proliferation. And so what we've been focused on is trying to say, can we take a step back and by looking at the phenotype about how cancer cells solve this proliferative problem, that is, understand how this network is regulated in cancer cells, might we get some insight into how this is solved, that is, how do you actually um, do biosynthetic or anabolic metabolism. And at the same time, we would argue that what would fall out of that is really identifying what those critical nodes are that might be appropriate places to, uh, to intervene for, for cancer therapy. And so the first story I'd like to tell you about is really an example of, of this. And that is, if you think about, well, here's acetyl-CoA. This is a very important biosynthetic molecule. It's used for lipid synthesis. It's used actually for synthesis of other things. It can do epigenetic regulation, as I'll, I'll allude to a bit later. However, most of us, you know, when we took our biochemistry class, think about, well, acetyl-CoA comes from glucose. Well, if you take a step back and you say, well, what's really the evidence to show that? There's actually not a lot of evidence to show that. And so one of the things that we really got to thinking about was, where does acetyl-CoA come from? And we thought this was particularly important in the context of lipid synthesis, because if you read the literature, you'll find statements such as, well, all you know, cancer cells synthesize their lipids de novo. Um, fatty acids come exclusively from glucose-derived carbon. And so we really wanted to do an experiment, since we couldn't find in the literature, that really addresses that. And so this is an example of, of um, C13 labeling that, um, that, that, that was introduced by the last speaker. And so if you feed cells fully labeled glucose with C13, you can track exactly this glucose-derived lipid synthesis pathway. And so the glucose gets broken down by glycolysis to pyruvate. That pyruvate can enter the TCA cycle to make acetyl-CoA combined with citrate. That citrate is then exported to the cytosol. Acetyl-CoA is regenerated in the cytosol by the action of ATP citrate lyase, and that's how you get cytosolic acetyl-CoA, and then that can get incorporated into newly synthesized lipid chains. And we can use GCMS to then look at the um, incorporation of this heavy carbon into the newly synthesized lipids. And so we can do this experiment, and we can prove that indeed, um, that indeed when you do this experiment, most of your lipids are indeed derived from glucose. However, no matter how hard we tried, we could never label all of the lipid carbons um, just by giving labeled glucose. And so that said, well, maybe the lipids are coming from, from somewhere else. Well, the obvious place to look at would be glutamine, and that's because there's a huge literature out there that some of you might be aware of, that that's the other major fuel used by cancer cells to grow. And so indeed, we did the same experiment where we added labeled glutamine and looked at their incorporation into lipids. And we found that, you know, indeed, glutamine could also provide some of the carbon for lipid synthesis. Now, Christian Metallo, who did this work, was interested, first off, well, is this the classic glutaminolysis pathway? So Craig Thompson, a number of years ago, published a, a, you know, a paper that glutamine could go through uh, what, what is termed glutaminolysis and be an important source of, uh, of, um, of, of various things needed to support cancer cells. And so that's glutamine getting converted to alpha-ketoglutarate, going clockwise around the TCA cycle to malate exported as pyruvate, and then the same pathway that glucose uses to make the acetyl-CoA. However, Christian, being a good scientist, really wanted to ask the question, well, maybe it wasn't happening that way, but instead, perhaps it was going by a reductive pathway, a pathway that was known to exist in some, in some rare um, tissues in vivo, 
And so we could use specific tracers to really ask that question. And I won't take you through the details of the tracing because I suspect not more than two or three people here would really be interested in me doing that anyway. But suffice it to say that when Christian did this experiment, he found surprisingly that almost all of this carbon that glutamine was contributing to lipid synthesis wasn't coming by this oxidative pathway, but rather by this reductive pathway. Now, I think it's arguable, maybe for metabolic nerds like ourselves, we'd say that 10 or 15 percent is a, you know, important contribution to something in, you know, in a cellular pool. However, you know, from a, you know, people interested in other things may, may not find this as interesting. However, it was the next experiment that was really one of those like, you know, once every year, five year, 10 year type things that sort of, you know, hits you over the head with, with how clear it was. And that is, in playing around with where this might be important, Christian did an experiment to ask, well, how did, this, how did hypoxia influence this process? That is, if he grew cells in normal oxygen versus um, normal tissue culture oxygen versus 1 or 2 percent oxygen um, in, in, uh, in, in culture, what he found was now glutamine by this reductive pathway wasn't a minor contributor to lipid synthesis, but it was actually now a major contributor to, to, uh, to lipid synthesis. And that's shown here in sort of an easier to see graphical format. And then if you ask where does the carbon come from when you make lipids, what you find is under normally growing cells, most of it comes from glucose, as much of your textbooks would say. But under hypoxic conditions, this switches nearly 100% to now where glutamine becomes the major source of carbon for, for, um, for making these lipids. Now, we think that we, first of all, I should point out, we see this in virtually all cancer cells that we've looked at. We've also looked at some normal, quote unquote, cells, to whatever extent there are normal cells in tissue culture, um, that also seem to do this. So it's possible this may not actually have to do with cancer, but may be a, a, a relic of, of all proliferating cells. Um, I should point out that this is actually a true increase in flux from um, glutamine into lipids. And so you might have guessed, well, maybe are you just like getting rid of the glucose contribution and all this remaining is that small percent from glutamine and that now becomes the dominant amount. But if we actually are quantitative about this, we find that overall lipid synthesis is decreased under hypoxia, but yet there is still both a decrease in the contrib contribution of glucose carbon and an increase in the contribution of, of uh, glutamine carbon. Now, the major difference we see that correlates with this in the rest of the metabolic network has to do with citrate, and that is we find that citrate levels always crash in a way into a very low point, which sort of may describe why this is the case if citrate's very low. Perhaps that's the driver by mass action of alpha-ketoglutarate coming from the glutamine back up to citrate to ultimately end up in, in, uh, in uh, lipid synthesis. Um, we think that this is at least mediated in part by this um, VHL HIF pathway that, uh, that uh, Bill Kalin um, introduced earlier, and that is that um, HIF, one of the targets of, of HIF as shown by a couple groups is pyruvate dehydrogenase kinase, which can be a negative regulator of pyruvate dehydrogenase, which controls the entry of pyruvate um, into the uh, TCA cycle. And so we think one reason citrate levels fall is because if you have less glucose carbon getting through pyruvate dehydrogenase, less of it ends up as, as citrate. Um, I think our best evidence from this really comes from looking at renal cell um, lines, some of which are VHL deficient. And what we find is that these VHL deficient renal cell lines, so VHL is what, um, as you heard, turns off the HIF pathway. Um, these are the only cells really that tend to use glutamine as their major lipid carbon source, even under normal, you know, even under normoxia. And we think VHL is at least somewhat important because if we can re-express VHL in some of these VHL deficient lines, which we find is we can now switch them back to using glucose um, in, in, instead of glutamine. And so why might this be the case? Why use glutamine carbon to make your lipids under hypoxia? Well, the reason we think this may be the case is that as many um, groups have shown over the years, it's actually very difficult to grow if you don't have glucose in the media. And that's thought to be the case because glucose is required to get into nucleotide synthesis. And it's actually very difficult to get carbon from down here in the pathway back up into these nucleotide biosynthesis pathways. And so if you're a cell that needs to grow under hypoxia, in physiological situations, if you're hypoxic, 
you're not just, you know, why would you be hypoxic? Well, you're hypoxic because you don't have a blood supply. Well, the blood delivers more than just oxygen. It also delivers glucose. And so if you're oxygen limited, you're also likely to be glucose limited. And so maybe you need to save that glucose for the pathways where you need it. And now you can use other substrates to build other things that, um, that can be um, derived from, from other nutrients, such as acetyl-CoA for, for um, lipid synthesis. Well, interestingly, our data suggests that IDH1, the same enzyme that you've heard from the last two speakers, may be involved in this pathway. And that's because if we eliminate isocitrate dehydrogenase, we can have an, have an effect on this pathway. And I should point out, if we knock down IDH2, we really don't see any effect, although these SHRNA experiments are always imperfect in really defining what is the correct isoform, although our evidence really would push that, this is, that, that IDH1 is what's involved. And so this argues that perhaps in addition to mutant IDH1 having a function in this reductive direction, maybe wild-type IDH1 can, can, can have the same property and perhaps explain part of what's going on. And I should say one of the major things that pointed us to that perhaps these mutant IDHs were a gain of function had to do with the limited number of residues being mutated. And so this is arginine-132 and IDH1 which is the same, the synonymous residue arginine-172 and IDH2 or arginine-140 and IDH2. And what all these residues do is they coordinate that CO2 group in isocitrate. And so if you don't coordinate that CO2 group, when you go in the, in the reductive direction, the CO2 doesn't get re-added, you get 2-hydroxyglutarate. Whereas if you have the wild-type enzyme and you have the CO2 there to coordinate, that's how you get citrate. And so there's some symmetry in what's going on between, you know, between the two situations. And it was pointed out by the previous speakers, I won't spend a lot of time on this, but the mutant really, the, the major finding there is that there's this accumulation of 2-hydroxyglutarate. I should point out the wild-type enzymes are still there, so mo and they still actually work as better enzymes, and so most of the rest of the metabolic network is unchanged. And so you really don't see a lot of other changes in at least metabolite levels, whereas you see this millimolar accumulation of 2-HG. And I really think that what this is doing, as we've heard from, from the previous two speakers, is really acting to um, work on this dioxygenase family of enzymes. And somehow this is impacting on epigenetic state of cells or some other enzymatic function that's critical for, uh, for differentiation or oncogenesis. And I should point out that, you know, where cells get acetyl-CoA, this also can influence epigenetics. And so that at least raises, in addition to acting as a growth pathway, maybe changes such as this can also influence metabolism in a way that can feed back to other cellular functions such as, such as epigenetic state. Now, with the last few minutes here of my talk, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the other aspect that our lab has been focused on, and that's pyruvate kinase M2. And we really have been focused on this because this actually acts as a key switch that seems to determine do cells do anabolic versus catabolic metabolism. And just to, to, to uh, summarize some work that's been published, so most cells, um, at least many cells that are focused on ATP metabolism, so those cells that really need to do a lot of oxidative phosphorylation, muscle, heart, brain, those cells express pyruvate kinase M1. M1 is a constitutively active enzyme, and something about having M1 really seems to promote this oxidative ATP-dependent metabolism, whereas, as you heard from David, um, PKM2 is found during embryonic development. It's found in cancer cells. It's actually found in some normal cells that are involved in, uh, in various metabolic functions. And what's special about PKM2 is exactly what led us there in the first place, and that it has the ability to be regulated by phosphotyrosine-mediated growth signals. And something about a phosphotyrosine interaction with pyruvate kinase M2 can influence its activity. Now, something about having this phosphotyrosine interaction to actually decrease activity seems to um, be associated with anabolic metabolism and as well as aerobic glycolysis. And so that has really led us to ask the question, well, does it really matter how you do metabolism? Does that matter for growth? And one of the first experiments we did to look at that that actually took us many years to accomplish was could we take advantage of what regulates this being an alternative splicing event? That is, you either include exon 9 to make PKM1 or exon 10 to make PKM2. So we asked, could we add LOX P sites around the M2-specific exon 10 and ask in a genetic experiment, would deletion of exon um, 10 um, allow us to then, say, switch to M1 or otherwise get rid of this isoform that might be required for, for tumors or at least 
seem to promote aerobic glycolysis and really ask the question, you know, is this a good target in cancer? And with that, I'd just like to thank the people who have done this work. I'm very fortunate to have a number of fantastic people in my lab. Point out that Demetrius Anastasio, a uh, postdoc in Luke Cantley's lab, helped um, many of the people in my lab with the, um, with, with, with the activator studies with input from um, Craig Thomas's group who developed the molecules, Hewan Park who did the structure, and the group at Agios that, um, that uh, did the in vivo PK. Christian Metallo, along again with people in my group, was, was responsible for the early IDH story and our funding sources. Thanks. Uh, questions for Matthew. So people still sort of satiated now. They've had enough metabolism for the morning. I mean, it, that was fantastic. So, you know, with the IDH, you have a perfect storm. You have a, uh, a built-in responder hypothesis, and you have a wonderful PD marker potentially, and so you could do a very focused clinical trial. Are you starting to think about uh, with this, these most recent agonists you described for us, whether there might be some genetic determinants of hypersensitivity or whether there would be some enrichment you can do for patients most likely to respond, and in the clinical trial, what are you going to measure? Yeah, so we've, cer we've, we've certainly thought a lot about that, and I have to say that's, that's really been, um, I guess, the, the, the sticking point. If someone said, all right, well, here's a molecule go do a clinical trial, I guess I'm not 100% sure right now what to do because pyruvate kinase M2, it's really expressed in most cancers. Um, we have actually have yet to find an ex a tumor that doesn't express pyruvate kinase M2. So you really don't have a responder hypothesis there. I guess our best thought right now has to do with it's really phosphotyrosine signaling that shuts off pyruvate kinase M2. And so maybe what's going on is that you're more dependent on turning off M2 in these really phosphotyrosine-driven cancers. We have some evidence for that. Uh, David, he, alerted, he alluded to this, um, you know, this serine pathway, and it's probably likely that these PHGDH amplifications can really do at least that's something similar to what PKM2 does, so I didn't have time to go into this in detail. But decreasing M2 activity also shunts more carbon into the serine synthesis pathway. So that says maybe you have a phosphotyrosine-driven cancer that, you know, is dependent on PKM2 for that, a PHGDH-amplified cancer that's less dependent on PKM2 for that. Maybe it's, and we, we have some evidence that those events um, are mutually exclusive, but whether or not this will play forward into a true responder hypothesis, I think it's way too early to say. Yeah. And are you testing at least the tool compound against sort of the cell line encyclopedia to see if we can just empirically determine that there are some cells that are hypersensitive to the inhibitor? Yeah, so, so with, the, with the help of Cyril Bennis and the, the former Jeff Settlement group, we've done that experiment. But the problem with this is, is that we can actually have PKM1 and get fine growth of cells and tissue culture. It's really the in vivo experiments where we see the big difference. And I guess that's, that's one of the challenges that, you know, any of us studying metabolism face, is that tissue culture media definitely influences metabolism. Tissue culture media, those of you, many of you know this, but it was not designed to mimic the in vivo situation. It made HeLa cells grow as fast as possible. And so what is going on in vivo and efforts to study metabolism in vivo, I think will actually be really critical to appropriately, um, you know, figuring out the right targets and the right ones to go after, to, after for, for trials. Any, yes, right there. Great talk, Matt. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I had a question about the redundancy of IDH1 and IDH2 and how it might be affecting um, lipid synthesis in tumors, except um, in comparison to normal cells. Because uh, it seems like there's three different forms of IDH, um, and only IDH1 and 2 are seen in tumors. Yeah, so IDH3 is really different. So IDH3 is the one you learned about in your biochemistry class, and it's the exception to the rule. It's mostly an enzyme that goes in the oxidative direction. It's a multi-subunit enzyme. It's a very different family. IDH1 and IDH2 are actually, you know, very similar in terms of their structure and their function. Craig Thompson has some nice data that shows that IDH, wild-type IDH2 can also function in the reductive direction, and he actually has a very interesting hypothesis that 
argues wild type IDH2 moving in the reductive direction and IDH1 moving in the oxidative direction is a way to shuttle reducing equivalence in and out of the mitochondria. Um, I have to say that it's a, it's, I agree it's an attractive hypothesis. I don't think the evidence is really there to say that's definitely what's, what's going on. I mean, from where we've looked, we can get rid of IDH1. The cells are not particularly happy, but we don't see any more reductive metabolism. We can get rid of IDH2. The cells aren't very happy. And we do see some reductive metabolism. And so that's really the only evidence we have that says IDH1 must be involved, mm -hmm. but it's, you know, the lack of evidence showing IDH2 is involved doesn't mean it's not involved. And so right now I actually tend to take, they both could be important. Um, you know, it's, what is clear is that you can get, um, you know, carbon from glutamine into acetyl-CoA, which really changes the landscape in terms of thinking about, you know, if you want to impact any of the processes involving acetyl-CoA, you can't think about just starting from glucose.